We can also fracture ribs in consequence. We know that an isolated rib fracture here or there is not going to be something that will increase patient mortality, but there are some situations where it can. If there's fractures of ribs one or two, there tends to be a higher mortality rate. Why is that? Actually, the vascular structures. We have, we, we have a hemorrhaging patient. So disruption of the vascular structures. Okay. Also, now there are experts disagree on the amount of fractured ribs it takes to constitute a flail chest. Some will say as few as two, and some will say as many as seven. It does. I'm, nobody's going to test you on the number. You have to be thinking about the fact that there's some in succession, like it may say two ribs in succession, three ribs, whatever. What I'm looking at here is, did it compromise the chest wall integrity? Have we broken our cage? That's what we're looking at. Is there a segment of the cage that's no longer intact? Okay? And that's what we'll refer to in just a minute as a flail chest. Very important that we are staying on top of pain management. What are you not going to do when your rib is broken or ribs? Breathe. You're not going to breathe deeply because it hurts like the dickens. You're not going to do anything that mobilizes that chest, are you? And yet, isn't that what we need you to do? We need you to take those deep breaths. We need to make sure we get those secretions out, etc. So teach them how to splint their chest with a pillow and teach them how to cough and deep breathe. So what am I going to have to do as a nurse to make sure that that happens? Medicate them for pain, okay? Uh, make sure that the patient has adequate pain control. It's just some pictures for you to look at. Yeah, yeah. So the flail chest, this is what we're talking about a minute, where we have the, a compromised cage. We need all those structures to remain intact, don't we? Even when the patient exhales, I don't need them collapsing. I need, them to, I need that rib cage to remain intact. If I've got two or more ribs on one side that are broken, it can compromise the integrity of that chest, that, that cage, that rib cage, such that it causes what we have a, what we call a flail chest. I'm going to show you what it looks like. This link worked the last time I looked at it. So it hopefully work today. It's a pretty cool video. Sometimes it'll tell me something's not working. Let's do it again. Here we go. I don't want Yep, this is it. I don't, I'm not going to enable the sound on here. You know, okay, look right here at this area right here. You see how it's sinking in when it should be going the other direction? Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. So what it creates is what we call a, a seesaw type of effect. Let's see if we got another one we can look at. The neat thing about YouTube, you guys, you have so many different things that you can Google today for actual video examples. Look here, see that? That's a, that's a good one. Y'all see how it's, during the inspiratory phase, it is sinking in. And during the expiratory phase, it goes back up. That is a flail chest, okay? So let's go back here. Oh, I don't, okay. Where was I at? Okay, so let's go back here and pick up more work. All right, so flail chest. We have, during the inspiratory phase, I have paradoxical movement, meaning that what I should see, the exact opposite is happening. 
same thing during the expiratory phase. I have opposite movement from what I should see during the expiratory phase and what I am seeing. And that's a result of those, those you know, your negative pressure is helping maintain all this. When we lose the function of the structure of the ribs, it's influenced by that pressure in an opposite manner. So what do we need to do for the patient with blunt force chest trauma, um, rib injuries, etc.? We want to make sure we have humidified O2. Why is that? Why humidified? <coughs> what does humidification help us with? Secretion, movement of secretions, okay? So we need humidified oxygen. Pain management is really, really important because I need my patient to be able to take those deep breaths, cough for me when I ask them to. Um, make sure that they have a good, a, a patent airway with plenty of fluid on board so we can make sure we get these secretions out. Well, again, I'll talk about ventilator studies later. Monitoring your vital signs, your ABGs, lab values, okay? And again, CVP, okay? Do we have some active bleeding going on in that chest wall? Here's another little cartoon drawing of paradoxical chest movement, okay? And what you might see. You see the, the bridge is broken. Okay, and so and it responds to that pressure within that chest cavity in an opposite manner than what it is. Now, the pneumothorax is something again different. We're going to another problem here at the lungs, and this is where we have a disruption of the pleural space. Something has disrupted the pleural space, and we lose our negative pressure. So, if we know that negative pressure keeps our lungs inflated because it has this sucking action. What happens if we lose the negative pressure? What happens to the lung? In layman's terms, it collapses. Okay? Because we lost that sucking action that keeps that lung pulled down in layman's terms. So what are some things that can cause a pneumothorax? Trauma. Accidents. Okay. Too much pressure. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we got lots of different things here. We can have a patient who is an accident victim and they've had some external trauma. A, they were impaled by a fence post in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, we can have a stabbing patient, a gunshot wound patient. We can have a patient who has COPD that when they coughed forcefully one time, punctured or, or perforated a bleb or a bullet. So I'm gonna write, write these words down. You're gonna look them up. B-L-E-B. B-L-E-B, bleb, bule, B-U-L-L-A-E, the plural form of it. What are these little things? What do they look like? And when you look them up, you'll see their little out pouches, pulmonary tissue, that can perforate with changes in pressure. Your patients who have these tend to be people who have chronically elevated pulmonary pressures already, like your COPD patient. And if those perforate, we can cause a pneumothorax intrinsically. So there's going to be outward signs of causes of pneumothoraxes and then there's going to be inward signs of pneumothoraxes, okay? Now what's important is understanding what's happening to the lungs, okay? And when would I see tracheal deviation one way versus another, okay? So I need a tall person. Pierce, you're a tall person. Um, Celeste, you're about my height, aren't you? Okay, so let's you're going to stay right here. Pierce, I need you to be the trachea. Because <laughs> you're tall. Thank you, trachea. So last you're going to be the right line. Okay, so the only thing that's keeping my trachea aligned is equal pressures. There's no anchors tying down that trachea. Okay? And so it's subject to equalized pressures keeping it aligned straight. Okay? So let's say I've had a gunshot wound on this side. All right, and it has ruptured my pleural space. There's a hole where air freely leaves with every breath I take. So it's not being built up inside. It's actually escaping with every breath. Whereas her side's functioning normally. Which side is gonna end up having higher pressure? Mine where air is escaping and not being trapped at all, or hers where it's normal? Hers. So what do you think Mr. Trachea is going to do in that case. I have lesser pressure, she has greater pressure. Which way is that? He's going to go towards me. So call me this way, Pierce. Okay, because her pr greater pressure is displacing the trachea this way. So with an open pneumothorax, where air can freely escape the pleural space, tracheal deviation will be towards the affected side. 
Okay, go back to the center again, Mr. Pierce. Now, let's say I have perforated a bleb through a forceful cough on this lung, but there's this little tissue flap that shuts back with every breath. So as I take a breath in, air escapes and gets into the pleural space. As I exhale, it shuts it right back off and traps the air. So with every breath, air is being trapped in my pleural space, every breath I take. Which side is going to end up with the greater pressure, me or Celeste? You will. I will. So now which way is Mr. Trachea going to go? Towards the unaffected side. Y'all see that? Now that tissue flap can happen with an external injury, like a knife wound or a gunshot wound. What, what the key is here is I have a piece of tissue acting as a valve. Okay? All right, thank you, Mr. Trachea and Mr. Ms. Wrightlong. <laughs> Your key is, which side is trapping air or releasing air with every breath? A tension pneumothorax occurs when the air remains trapped. Now, how can that be life-threatening? And how does it happen so fast? Because as every breath I take is building pressures within that thoracic cavity, what is it gonna impede from that point forward. Think the vena cava. Um, Venus return to the heart. We've got, there's, there's only so much room for everything to do its job in here. Everything needs space to do it. When I increase the volume within this confined cavity, I'm going to eventually decrease Venus return, aren't I? Because I'm putting so much pressure in this cavity. So what vital sign is gonna drop with the tension pneumothorax? Blood pressure. Blood pressure. That's a life-threatening emergency. So what, what might I see? Again, I don't have symmetrical chest expansion, not paradoxical. It's a completely different thing here. I'm simply saying that if this side is the sick lung, it's not going to expand to the full extent that this side does because the lung isn't expanding. So I'm going to see asymmetrical chest rise and fall. When I listen to this patient, Depending on the size of the pneumothorax over here, I may have absent breath sounds. And when I go do percussion, I'm looking for that stud in the wall, what am I going to hear this time? That hollow, that resonant, because there's no mass there. It's all air. Lung is wadded up in a little ball. Okay? Everybody good so far? So, Again, every, and, and if it continues to escape into the tissues, we might have sub-Q air, little rice crispy crackles mm -hmm. all the way up into the neck. Here's a little visual for you. You can see this patient has lost their negative pressure, so the lung collapsed. All of this is not going to be, this chest is not near going to rise to the same size as this size because the lung is not expanding. When I listen to them, I'm going to have absent breath sounds all around here. And when I go to do my percussion, this is all going to sound hollow or hyper-resonant. Now, it's a life that, and, and, and again, we might start seeing that tracheal deviation. In this case, if this is a tension pneumothorax, which way is this trachea going to go? It's going to go this way, right? Because this is going to have the greater pressure. Now, if this was a pneumothorax that was allowing air to freely escape, which way is the trachea going to go? This way, okay? Understand it's all dependent on pressure. So what do we need to do? Well, first of all, you need to be quick to detect it. Don't, don't be piddling around. Because every breath that the patient takes is getting bigger. So quick detection, because then we need to make a ring a dingy dingy. What do we need to say? We need to report our, we start with the S bar. I have a patient in acute respiratory distress. I got your attention, right? My situation, background. Patient is a chronic you know, COPD patient, had a forceful cough while ago and started complaining of immediate pain and difficulty breathing. That's all, that's as much as we're gonna go into the background. We don't have time to go, they had a hysterectomy 15 years ago. <laughs> then we're gonna go quickly to our assessment findings. I have asymmetrical chest movement, I have absent breath sounds on the affected side, tracheal deviation, hyper resonance on percussion. What size needle would you like? <laughs> because we're gonna do a needle decompression at, at bedside. 16, 18 gauge, and they typically go pretty high on the ribs with those. Why would we go high? Because air rises. If I'm draining fluid, I'm gonna go low. But I need to get air out, so we're gonna go for, not you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
your provider will go pretty high and, and it sounds like you pop the tire. It is loud. All this air comes rushing out of the floral space. Lung hopefully can re-expand and they'll follow that up with a chest tube. Okay? Everybody good so far? So again, we talked about all of this. And, and when, okay, again, I want to stress, you're not really looking, I just want you to, to, to look at this and see what we're talking about. You see your rib margins, and then you see that light, this go, the haziness of a lung. And if you look over here, you got pitch black. Because this is your lung, this is your cardiac silhouette. Here's your lung, okay? And you're like, Whoa, that can't be good. Now, we talk about some things that can cause a pneumothorax, but there's things that we do in healthcare that can cause a pneumothorax, like putting in a central line. We can disrupt that pleural space. Um, an ET tube can do that, when, especially if you add PEEP on your ventilator. Okay, and I, you know, I'll talk about ventilator things later. Um, a trach can disrupt the pleural space and cause that. So there's lots of different things that we do in healthcare that can actually cause a patient to have a pneumothorax. Okay, we talked about all of this already. Yeah. Chest X-rays definitely, but um, I'll get the bars for chest two. Talk about that. Okay, hemothorax. We're going back to that like chest cavity area and pleural space area combined. You have blood that is escaping to that chest cavity, typically due to a um, traumatic injury. Again, what hemodynamic value would be very helpful for me here? CBP would be great, wouldn't it? Because we're going to look at blood fluid volume. Why do I have decreased breath sounds? Because I've got a collection of blood. Remember, fluid settles. You'll, I'll show you the picture in just a minute. <coughs> but we need to get in there and get the, what's causing the bleeding under control, drain the blood out, potentially even open the patient's chest cavity to evacuate the blood and find the bleeder. What's bleeding? What, what's causing this, okay? Um, my students, might have been last semester, got to see a bedside open thoracotomy. And one of them got to perform chest compressions on a two-hour post cabbage. Pretty cool. Um, but they got to see that chest opened up at bedside. Uh, we can give the, we replace the blood volume, or fluids, whatever. These are the ones where I'm just going to kind of go whatever. Penetrating, penetrating chest wounds, so gunshot, knife, whatever. Something has gotten into that pleural space. Same clinical manifestations though. If I've caused a pneumothorax, I'm going to have signs and symptoms of a pneumothorax. If I've caused a hemothorax, I'm going to have signs of blood loss in the wall, volume there. Um, if it's like a pleural fusion but filled with blood, that's what we call a hemothorax, okay? Um, so it's, it's essentially the same thing, just a different causation, okay? We're not spend a lot of time going. Okay, this is an example of how we would treat that pneumothorax where I have air escaping. Okay, so here we have a patient with looks like a gunshot wound. And when you look across the straight chest, you'll see a flutter. I'm going to give a sign of a flutter. You know, if, you, if that doesn't make sense, you Google it. You'll, you'll see pictures of it, okay? That would be, although it's not normal, it would be an expected finding. Like your tire pressure light indicator is not normal to see it, but when you walk up to your car and your tire flight, you would expect to see it, okay? So understand expected versus complication. We'll see that mediastinal flutter. But let's look at the nature of this dressing. Why do you think, first of all, remember this wound had a sucking sound, so air is freely escaping with every breath. Why do you think I wouldn't put a completely occlusive dressing here? So, because that means no air can escape and I caused a pneumothorax. pneumothorax. So we put it on at the end of the expiratory phase. We leave the bottom end open because we know air rises, right? So I don't need air entering underneath that little bad boy. So it's kind of like a one-way valve. Kind of, but it's also allowing, it's still allowing it to escape, but we're not going to cause a tension in the thorax, okay? Until this patient goes to the surgery, have this prepared. Okay?
Now there's a key word in your question. One key word, what is it? Best. Best, good job, Pierce. best. When you have those kinds of questions, that means every single one of these is a sign and symptom. Which one is gonna be more conclusive for this problem? Which is why when you're doing concept maps, we're very specific about what you put as an outcome. So if we look at it, that what any trauma, we're gonna tachycardia, it's not specific. Diminished breath sounds could be a couple of different things. Tachypnea is very non-specific. But if I'm looking at my O2 status less than 90, again, could be anybody. So which one's gonna tell me out of those four that the pneumothorax is most likely my problem? B. Because isn't it a pneumothorax, remember with a pneum, okay, we've got a couple things that can cause diminished breath sounds, right? Don't we have a total effusion too? Mm -hmm. But we're, we, based on the patient's history and presentation, we're leaning towards, in this question, a pneumothorax, right? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm like, well, dang, they're all. But which one's gonna be more conclusive to a pneumothorax? Is it B? B. Okay. What was the other thing I just said that we might have diminished breast sounds with? Floral effusion or hemothorax. All right, let's look at this one. And again, there's gonna be a key word. Good job, Pierce. One rib. Okay, that right there is very important to know, isn't it? We have one rib. All right, now which two are you going to remove right away as potential options? B and C. B and, B and C, because nobody's breathing deep. It hurts too much. The key word A in the presentation is giving me the ability to eliminate one other possibility. D. D. That's right, it can't be. We're not gonna have a flail chest with one rib fractured. So that means pain associated with inspiration. Okay, so when you when you're practice questions, guys, be able to pull out the key things in the either in the presentation or within the question itself. What are the key things? What is this question asking me? Rule out, if it's not like the question before where they're all possible, rule out the impossibles you're going to narrow it down to two go back and look at what it's telling you and then rule out that other one in the question before all indicate a pneumothorax but which one is much more specific to the pneumothorax out of those four things they've given you okay and that'll help you as you're looking at it okay guys we are going to move on into the part two just because we have one day after that oh don't yeah. spending a lot of time on some things here just wanted to kind of refresh your memory okay on different problems so if we have anything that occurs in this part of the body I don't care if it's an anterior disc anterior approach cervical disc repair a CE what, what do you worry about anyway this is this is an important part of my body and I don't need it obstructed okay so just as an overview of your AMP um, 
to briefly go over some cancer things because you also had this in 201. So again, a lot of it's going to be some over. Okay? But if the patient has had laryngeal cancer, one of the things they present with most often is that, that you know, interruption in their ability to speak. Okay? So primary cause that we know what it, we, we know what this can disrupt. If there's cancer here, we know what that kind of what that can look at. It can distort their appearance. We have surgical procedures there. We've got voice box issues. We, we understand that. And communication, of course. I'm not going to do the video of cancer of the larynx. You can, you can do the that. What are your primary risk factors for patients with cancer in this part of their body? It's your alcohol and your smokes. Remember we talked about alcohol with module A and how destructive it is to cardiac tissue and how destructive it is to neural cells. Um, alcohol causes a, a chronic inflammatory state, especially when it's ingested in quantities that causes intoxication. When we, use, when we, when we look back at what's the root word for intoxication, it's called poison. Okay, um, so your alcoholic who have to do tobacco abuse two of your primary risk factor patients for this type of cancer okay of course there's other things um and, and if we know that people who have nutritional deficiencies are at risk for multiple different things because we don't have the energy for cellular repair growth what have you okay and then there's some viruses and some and gastroesophageal reflux disease that cause that chronic um, irritation as well so assessments we're going to be um quantifying how much our patient smokes. And so how do we do that? We do that with called PATH year histories. How do you quantify PATH year histories? How many packs a day times how many years you've been smoking? So if I've been smoking a half a pack a day for five years, what's my PATH year history? Two, four, five. Okay, if I've been smoking two packs a day for 15 years, what's my PATH year history? 30. Okay, and so that's how we record that. Um, make sure you take time to look inside your patient's mouth, explore their dentition, ask them about their, but they might not think about that there's any significance or importance to the fact that their dentures don't fit anymore. They might not correlate that with anything. That's your job to know what to ask. Have you noticed a difference in the way your dentures fit, your partial plates? Any problems there? Anything constantly being irritated within your mouth or your throat, okay? And as a consequence of those things, they often will start losing weight. The presentation the patient usually comes to you with is this hoarseness. That's usually one of the first things the patient will come and seek help for. Remember, people don't come voluntarily to a doctor's office just because they want to spend a copay today. They come because something has disrupted their normal life. Their day to day, I can't work, I can't talk, whatever it may be, okay? So this hoarseness that's pervasive for greater than two weeks is often one of the reasons the patient will actually come and seek help. So we're, we're, I'm not gonna go through all of the free stuff you guys know, okay? You, you go through an extensive history with your patient, a discussion with them, examining the oral cavity, the throat, what have you. Um, their mucosa, all, but all the business. They're going to go through a lot of different diagnostics. Now, some labs that are very important on here are those last three albumin, pre albumin, and glucose. Because what are we looking at with the albumin and pre albumin? Their nutritional status. How much is this patient, you know, do we need some help? Do we need some dietary involvement here? Okay, because those are big indicators as far as the healing process later in the patient's nutritional state today. So glucose, albumin, and pre-albumin are very important values for us to look at, okay? But they're going to have a whole host of labs as well. So what is medicine going to do about head, neck, and throat cancer? Well, they're going to look at different, different modalities to treat it. Do we need surgical intervention? Do we need chemotherapy? Do we need radiation? Or do we need a combination of approach? We call it multimodal. And, and that's going to be based on a discussion to have with the patient, the progression of the disease, the age of the patient, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. What do you think your priority is out of that list of things? Patent airway. Because if we don't have patent airway, nothing else is going to matter. So making sure that that airway remains patent. Who? Oh, Jay, he's not here today. Had the gentleman, who 
Who was with Jane TCU that day? Had the gentleman with the giant mask. Y'all remember that? Is anybody in there with him out of my group? He had struck. Was it you? You can hear him go. Ugh. Yeah. Can we get that thing out today? He had a big old mass impinging his larynx. Visible mass, okay? Um, and he had strider, you know, whoop, uncomfortable. Airway is your priority. So if we do a non-surgical management and they choose the radiation, chemo, whatever, um, what are your, y'all remember back from 201, if your patient has had, they've been, they've gone for their initial visit for their radiation therapy, what will they end up with where they know where to target those beans next time? The markings. Now those markings tend to be a little more, they don't tend to wash off as easy today, but still, what do we want to teach our patient regardless? Don't try to take them off. They need to stay. Okay? Uh huh. And what do we want to teach the patient in terms of protecting their skin? Stay out of the sunlight, cover it in the sunlight, don't use a razor, right? Um, be careful, you know, this is not the time to be putting that old aftershave on, okay? Because we know that radiation burns, okay? Is it specific only to that tissue? Well, they're going to try to mark it where it's more specific, but it's going to take out some other tissue as well. So, we need to talk to our patient about things like xerostomia. What does that mean? Dry mouth. Dry mouth. We need to teach them that that might be permanent. Because as they target that radiation this area, it may take salivary glands with it. So we want to make sure that the patient knows that that could be a permanent thing, okay? Um, so careful, take care of the markings, don't ruin those markings. Um, now, be careful what you're teaching them here, okay? Because you don't need anything from Bed Bath & Beyond. No, Bath & Body Works. <laughs> that story. No. Right, we don't need all the frou-frou stuff <laughs> on this excoriated skin. Okay, we need um, things that don't have that perfume base and are approved by their provider. Would we teach them to put Vaseline here? Uh -uh. Vaseline goes one, well, there's two places you can use Vaseline. On the lips, and it's, even in healthcare, it's not necessarily the best way. You use a KY lubricant for a rectal temp, okay? But, that, but that's really all. Okay, don't use Vaseline outside of here, okay? Because what does Vaseline do? It doesn't allow oxygen to permeate. It is a, um, it traps things underneath. It traps moistures, and so we, it's just not Vaseline on the lips. Be gone with it. At home, if you don't have KY, and you got to do that little munch of rectal temp, little little Vaseline on the high end, anybody. That's it. But we want to teach them to make sure that they keep their skin protected, okay? So again, patient ed is really important here from a head, neck, and throat patient. We also got some more patient teaching we want to do. Um, remember that xerostomia, you kind of want to let them know that ahead of time, okay? This dry mouth may be a permanent consequence, and this is what you're going to do to treat it. A little saline, spritzes, gargles, whatever. Chemo. If I told you your patient's getting chemotherapy, what should you think immediately? We call that what kind of what kind of isolation is that? Neutropenic precautions, reverse isolation, whatever. Because who are we protecting now? The patient. patient from everybody else. Whereas typically on isolation, you're protecting everybody else from the patient. This is the opposite. We're protecting our patient. So it goes without saying, I'm going to make sure my patient is isolated without being around other people. Do I tell them that their family can't come see them? No, they need their support system, but who would they not let up there see them? Little Linus's. No, Pigpen, what's his name on Charlie Brown? You know what I'm talking about? The little one with the blanket? Like some little lines? Lines? Yeah. A little dirt cloud falls him everywhere? Yeah. Children are little germ bombs. They got everything growing everywhere. <laughs> and then we don't need the little munchkins up there. Okay? Um, hand hygiene. Why is hand hygiene better than gloves? What, do, what does hand hygiene do for you? And does that later on? It prevents the transmission of pathogens, and it prevents pathogens from being on your hands, okay? Just because you've got on a pair of gloves, guys, doesn't mean you're protecting anybody. You're protecting yourself, but that doesn't mean you're protecting your patient, right? Okay? We're just protecting ourselves from getting contaminated hands. We're not necessarily protecting the patient. Get it? Okay, I'll bring that goes back to 102. Don't forget. Um, so, 
again here, we're going to be proactive in helping our patient control their symptoms because they're most likely going to be anorexic, not anorexia nervosa. If they don't have anorexia, why? What's causing that? The chemotherapy. Okay, so be careful what you bring this patient to eat. Don't be walking in there with fish day. Um, you know, low odor foods, palatable foods, grits, um, baked potato, mashed potatoes, things like that that are palatable and have a low odor, low flavor. Okay, they'll wait till they're vomiting to give them their anti-emetic. Let's just be proactive. They have that little wave of nausea. Let's get in there and get that taken care of because nutrition is really important for this patient. Okay, head coverings, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, is the what's alopecia? Is that permanent? It, is it permanent? Is alopecia permanent? No. And is everybody that gets chemo going to lose their hair? No. no. Not everybody will. Okay. Um, so this is just again overall everything. Y'all remember that when we're talking about alternative therapies and adjunctive therapies, are they to take the place of pharmacolog pharmacological agents or to support and supplement them? Okay, and y'all remember, if you ever if you ever question that, just remind yourself, if you're sitting in a dentist's chair and you're about to have a filling or a root canal, and your dentist says, just look at the post trip there. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's not gonna work. Okay, uh, and, and don't be playing no soothing music because I'm not soothed right now. Okay, think about why we use these adjunct therapies is to help those things work together, but not to replace them, okay? Um, all right, surgical management. Are you going to be performing the surgery? No. no. But don't you need to have a working knowledge of the procedure? Yeah. Because if your patient has a question after the provider has explained the procedure to them, you need to have an intelligent discussion, right? Mm -hmm. I think I used the analogy earlier when we were in module A that you know, if your patient's about to go for hysterectomy, for instance, and Ms. Crittenden asked me, she goes, well, well, what is a hysterectomy? And I said, well, heck if I know, but I'll be here to take care of you when you get back. Mm -hmm. What's she going to say? I don't want Do you have anybody else out there taking care of me besides you? So you're not going to be tested on NCLEX on a surgical procedure. NCLEX wants to know, do you know how to get the patient ready? Do you know what to monitor for if you are there intra-op? And do you know how to take care of them post-operatively? That's what they want to know. So preoperatively, if a patient's going for a laryngectomy, ectomy means we've done what? Taken it out. And if it's a larynx, it's the larynx we've removed. If they're going to go, we've got a lot of education to do ahead of time. Like, how are we going to be able to communicate with the patient? How are they, how are they going to communicate with us, OK? Um, if there's time and you can expose them, just like we talked about module A, that critical care environment, it's pretty intimidating, isn't it? And you're in healthcare, so imagine what a person, a lay person feels when they come to those areas, okay? How are we going to feed our patient? All this discussion takes place ahead of time. So vocal cord stripping, exactly what it says. They're going to strip the lesions off the vocal cords, okay? Um, Cordectomy, they're going to actually remove them. Laser will be more targeted toward those areas. Now, big difference between my partial and my total, and this goes to pre-op education. Your partial laryngectomy patient, let me put it this way, both are going to come back with a trach. The partial is a temporary trach. The total is a permanent trach. Again, a discussion the patient should have had ahead of time. Both will come back with a tray and that's to prepare the airway, protect the airway. All the edema and the surgical procedure, etc. The total laryngectomy patient's tray is permanent. So, as you talked about a lot of trachs in 105, we're going to go refresh through some of those things, but just to, just to think, okay? Um, if there's a flap, a surgical flap here, and I don't, it doesn't matter if the flap is here, into the tissue flap or if it's a graft on the leg, what are you worried about when the patient comes back with a tissue graft? Infection. What's your number one? What's the first thing we're worried about? That was a needle in the Is it graft or something? Is it graft taking? That's right. Because in that first that's right, in that first twenty four hours is when we're gonna see that it, there was no perfusion to the graft. That tissue's not viable. So I'm going to be very, very concerned about the color of it, the temperature of it, et cetera. And we want, to, we want to make sure that that graft gets blood supply and oxygen, okay? 
Now, along with that, we're going to worry about bleeding and infection and what have you. We're going to keep the suture line clean by every hour with sterile saline because we know we can kind of help that tissue as far as instead of um, scabs forming, we can let tissue heal, okay? Again, all the rest of it's kind of, if that makes sense. With in that type of surgical procedure in this area, there's always the potential for airway obstruction, which is why again we come back with the tray. Um, and all this stuff. <laughs> okay. Two more recurrence. There's no guarantee that the that the what caused it is not still present and couldn't recur. This is where I'm saying you guys go back and review. Okay. The only thing that's really new here that you might not talk about a lot was the pneumothorax. And if you think about where that trach's at, it's right there in the apices of the lungs, right there in those top pleural spaces, and it can disrupt that pleural space, okay? Um, which would cause the, the sub-Q air, et cetera. What do you need to have with a new trach at bedside? Suction. Suction, what else? Airway. Another airway, okay? Because are you gonna, if that were to be accidentally dislodged, are you gonna get another one back down there? It's not the same size you want because of all the edema, okay? So we want to make sure that we don't let it become dislodged, okay? We want to make sure secretions are managed with adequate hydration and that we've got our suction set up so we can keep that airway clear, okay? This cuff I will talk about more when we get to ET tubes. All right, so again, look in the mouth with the oral cavity. Do we see some lesions that we should have addressed and paid pay attention to? This is not going to be an NCLEX question. It's not going to be a test question. But for grins, what is it? Sore throat. All right, now this one, I want you to think about for a little bit. All right, so we're teaching a patient that's about to go home, and they say something that tells us we need to continue our instruction. So, patient says, I will protect the stomach from water. Is that true or false? True. true. So we're good. I need to use air conditioning with humidification. And you can say I need, need to use heating with humidification to provide warm, cool air to assist with breathing. Mm -hmm. True? Because okay. humidification is your key here. I need to keep powders and sprays away from the stomach side. True. true. I need to apply a thin layer of petroleum, aka Vaseline, to the skin to prevent, to prevent cracking. Yeah. True or false? Oh. False. All right. I, again, I'm going to move on quite quite quickly here because this is 201 stuff. So lung cancers so are just in a different place now. Primary carcinogens are pretty much the same. Your tobacco abuser here, or people who have been exposed to known carcinogens that have, or have chronic pulmonary disease that causes that chronic inflamed state. Um, the, the key difference here between is it a small cell or a large cell is the nature of the metastasis. Typically with your small cell you have extensive metastasis by the time it's discovered. Okay, and, and again the example I always use here is sugar ants. You ever had sugar ants come in your house or your cabinet or your back porch? They come like from nowhere and then you can't figure out where they're going or where they hide. There's not even a hole there. They're, but they very quickly, quickly invade and they're very small, so they can spread pretty quickly. Whereas large cells, your snail, takes a little longer to get where it wants to go. Can't really invade those small spaces like the small cell can. So often when your patient presents with large cell, you have a better um, prognosis because we've usually caught it a little earlier, okay? So, and that's not for, as a, a nurse, I don't, I just need to, if my patient were to ask me, why is my doctor not being aggressive with this? And he told me it was just, extensively metastasized everywhere, I can have an intelligent discussion with them, okay? Pictures for you, remember we talked about fluid on chest x-rays? Fluid isn't going to do that. It's not gonna stay there. So we have either an infectious process or a neoplastic process. And they will do biopsies, whatever, to determine that. So a patient will present with a persistent cough, maybe some blood tinge sputum, when, you're, when your patient reports blood thinning, you know, make sure you really query them that it wasn't something that they spit out of their mouth. Because people will perceive that as sputum. 
where's the speed them come from? The lungs. So you ask them, did you cough immediately prior to that? Or did you just get through brushing your teeth? Okay, we wanna make sure we know exactly where that came from. And then we'll, we'll be collecting a speed specimen. Um, the chest pain is gonna be atypical chest pain, so atypical for ischemic pain. As the disease progresses, they lose their appetite, a lot of problems with nausea, vomiting. We're gonna talk about the mediastinal involvement in just a minute, okay? You may have some difficulty swallowing depending on the location of the lesions. Is it interfering with the swallowing ability now because of where it's pressing to the lungs? I told you there'll be a host of diagnostics. A biopsy is gonna be real conclusive as to what, what we're dealing with. A thoracity is where they go with a scope and look in the chest, and a thoracentesis where they know that is where they draw the fluid. But like I said, they'll send the fluid off for cytology. Okay, what kind of cells are in that fluid? Um, and then scans to determine what was the primary tumor and where has it spread to? And how do we know if it's spread? Because if we're doing a colonoscopy and we biopsy some tissue, it comes back as pulmonary tissue. Where did it come from? The lungs. And that means it has metastasized. Okay, because we shouldn't see lung cells in a colon. So we've got some, some significant metastasis here. And that's what this is referring to. Is it, in, is it right there localized? or has it spread to the lymph nodes? If it's spread to the lymph nodes, where has it gone from there? So we go from the actual site to the, to the lymph nodes to where it could have possibly gone from there. If lymph nodes are empty, we can be reasonably comfortable there probably hasn't been any metastasis. But there's two ways things have metastasized. And one is through the bloodstream itself. So if it goes through that lymph lymphatic system, it's, it's gonna spread. But the other is through hormones hormonal influence, okay? So they're gonna make sure they rule out any metastasis because of these two different ways that we can actually spread our cancers. So surgical management here, we've got the same management we have for head, neck, and throat, but we've added palliative. What's palliative care? It's like comfort care. Now, when guys, you'll see that families sometimes, and we see this a lot in the units, they're reluctant to do comfort measures because they they perceive that that means you're not going to do anything to help them in the meantime, and that's not true. Um, I think Quan got to see this with one of the nurses, and I was I, I loved it. Um, this young man, the nurse, told the daughter, I think it was a daughter. Um, the patient's on comfort measures now, but I'm still gonna prone position her to op optimize her oxygen exchange. We're still gonna maintain her drips. We're still gonna do anything heroic now if she develops the PNP tac. Okay, she's already on the ventilator, so we're, we're not, you know, we've got that managed. Um, and it gives the family some comfort to know that you're not just turning everything off and walking out the door. Now there are situations where we do, we terminate care, okay? That's, that's a little bit of a different. But palliative care, in a nutshell means death with dignity, okay? We're not gonna do anything heroic, but that doesn't mean we just shut the door and let you stay with your family now, we're not gonna do anything else, okay? We're gonna make sure that you're comfortable, that your nausea is under control, your, your psychosocial status has been, you've been given the support and resources you need there, and your pain is you're under control, okay? So we're gonna make sure our patient has death with dignity. Okay. Nursing, again, airway is really important and that psychological support. We're going to build on that again. So same history thing, same type of assessment. I said we would talk about that mediastinal involvement. Okay, where's the mediastinum at? You could draw a rectangle. Oh, where my zipper is kind of. Okay, this is your mediastinum. All right, if the patient has a mass in the mediastinum, what function is it going to impact? Whose function? Who else is there nearby? The heart. Okay, remember, so we're talking about a lung cancer in the mediastinal area. Whose function is it going to impact? The hearts. Okay, because it can actually press on that heart. So it's going to block that blood flow 
the venous system of this part of the body. So let's look at this picture. I have this lady, and you see this venous engorgement across her chest. That is not normal. Now you may see venous engorgement on a patient's legs, but you should be seen on a chest. She has this collar edema. Do you see this ring of edema right here? Doesn't show you very well, but periorbital edema, but the primary is the collar edema, the venous engorgement across the chest. Because what's happening is this, this tumor has grown to the point now that it's pressing on that superior vena cava. It's not allowing volume to return from that direction back to the heart. So instead, what it's doing is backing up. Okay? So what are we going to see? Mental status changes first. Cyanosis to follow simultaneously with your cardiac output dropping, which means what vital sign is going to drop? Blood pressure. If cardiac output goes down, your blood pressure goes down. Okay? And then death. All right? Now, it's interesting that a few years back, we had two back-to-back -back patients with this. Could not believe it. I hadn't seen it in years, and all of a sudden I got two back-to-back -back patients with this. Both were female. And so what are we going to do with this patient? We've got this giant mass, but it's around all this vasculature. Not a lot we can do. Because it's hard to remove a tumor that's wrapping around vasculature. So what they did with one lady is they took her to radiation to try to shrink it as much as they could to give the family some time to make some decisions. And with the other, they did end of life. Okay, because you know, we've got this large mass that's now affecting cardiac function. This is not the time for us or family to say, I told you you should put those cigarettes down. That's not helpful now. Okay? And so we want to be supportive of the patient. None of us is perfect. We all do something we shouldn't do. Um, I like salt entirely too much. But I'm hypotensive, so right now, I'm good. But the day ever comes, I have to give it up. It's going to be a hot problem. Um, none of us is perfect, and we don't have the right to judge anybody else. Okay? So instead of having your patient wall with the shoulda, coulda, woulda, what are we going to do? What are you going to do if you didn't like your first test grade? Did you wallow in that forever, or what did you do? What can you change? Can you change the past? What can you change? Uh, your future. So what am I going to do about it? So what we can do is empower our patient with hope. No, we're not not false hope, but hope that today's going to be a good day. So we we help them take control of their health care, make decisions regarding their health care, give them that quality of life. Okay, provide them resources. Provide resources. And sometimes, you guys, it's something as simple as put them in a wheelchair and let them get some sunshine on their face. It changes their whole day. Help them ambulate. Help them optimize their nutrition. Okay? They're, they're dealing with all of this already, and they don't need you to make it worse. And we, we, we need to help the patient. What can we do? Non-surgical management with chemo, same concerns. Radiation, same concerns. Okay? Nothing's changed in different places. Surgical procedures, this is just more or less a definition of what we're talking about. Here we remove a lobe. We can remove a wedge. We can remove a segment. Here we remove the entire lung. Now, what do I need to know as a nurse? If we've had a, go ahead, John. Very good. If, they, if they've had a pneumonectomy, they're not gonna have breast cells on that side, okay? If a patient has had an open thoracotomy, meaning we have been inside this chest cavity, they're going to come back with a chest tube, except you might not always see that with the pneumonectomy. There's no lung for us to worry about keeping inflated. Okay? Now, I'm not going to tell you that you'll never see it. Remember those words, all, every, never, those aren't the right options. Okay? But typically, they don't have a chest tube. There's nothing to worry about inflated there. Okay? Um, this is where, again, people can live with one lung. Do normally when they have the, like, the lung removal, does that check in? Did they expect it to still deviate? A, a little bit? bit. A little bit. It won't be anything gross or obvious up here. Okay. Because when they seal off that bronchial part, mm -hmm. it kind of normalizes pressures again. Okay. 
Um, but please don't tell them that they're breast down sounds good on both sides. <laughs> and it's like, really? <laughs> That's the first. <laughs> you may hear a whisper, though. When, when you're listening to, when I say whisper, you may hear resonant breath sounds come across. So it's not like it's just dead, but you're not going to hear that inspiratory and expiratory phase, okay? Um, I've had patients with lungs. It's uh, completely removed. All right. Let's see if we got this one. So we've got a patient who's neutropenic because they've been getting chemotherapy and we're trying to take care of our patients. So we know that because they're neutropenic, our priorities prevent them from getting anything, correct? So what are we going to do about that? Well, we know the patient needs their support system, so we're not going to restrict all visitors, are we? We know they've got to have optimal nutrition and water is nutrition, so we don't definitely don't want to restrict fluid. We don't want to cause them to get a hospital-acquired infection any time, so we're not going to be putting them in Foley patient. We would want them to teach the patient and the family how to use hand hygiene. first thing, but what would be something that would be very specific to the syndrome? CC. Okay, so if you're looking at this kind of question, yes, mental status changes will occur, but are there other things that this isn't necessarily very specific to? But what is very specific to this is what? Periodic order. Okay? I think that's the last slide, isn't it? Or is there one more? Okay. All right, so we went through parts one and two. Part three, again, you do yourself a favor because there's some parts on trains so on part three. I'm not taking class time to go over. I will talk about the cuff, but I'm not going to spend any discussion about the trach itself, okay? Mr. Money's going to be presenting to you the chest tubes, or the, the purpose of a chest tube, the function of a chest tube, what to look for for a normally functioning one, when to know that you have a problem, okay? Um, we'll be talking about ventilator settings. That's a, that's a big part of part three, okay? And what ET tubes are. But I'm not gonna, we, we simply don't have time to bring every course through every course. We would never get out of the program. So we need you go through part three and refresh yourself on traits. What, what are my concerns, blah, 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 blah. I'm gonna spend time on the traits on the cuff alone, okay? And the vent settings, those will be the priorities for the next time. Um, what else? Do you guys have any questions about this? You guys, I've got one more day with you. Same, same, same. You want to <laughs> Isn't that cool? Yes. We wish we, we wish you could just take you through them to the fine. I know, but you know, listen, guys, it's really, you can say, it's really going by fast. 